Fowler, and welcome to Sports Century. He was sometimes described as a one-man Mount Rushmore, monumentally silent, grim, and enduring. For 29 seasons, Tom Landry rode herd on the Cowboys, taking them from birth into full-blown manhood as they captured 13 divisional titles and had a record 20 straight winning seasons. But if Dallas became America's team, the tall, standoff Texan rarely shared in his players' popularity. For many, he seemed a tad too good to be true and far too serious to be loved. I wound up watching uh, the moon landing that night of July 20th of 1969 right next to Tom Landry. The rest of us were jumping up and down, you know, when they finally stepped down to the moon. But uh, Tom kind of gave it one of these. He had just turned 20, and he was co-piloting the P-51. So the engine started feathering out. They were getting ready to bail out. And he just, you know, very coolly changed the gas mixture, and the engine started up again. So I asked him about that. I said, you know, do you ever... ever get Afraid you you get shot at? No, I, I, I didn't give it much of a thought. A lot of the fans they can't stand it because you know somebody will make a big play and and they'll look at me and I'm not doing anything. <laughs> His image was to be stoic, to be dry, to be uninhibited by the things that go on around you. That clean, shined, polished, well dressed, intelligent organized man at the top of the ship, Tom Landry. Landry represented organizational strength, a certain stoicism, seriousness, religiosity. He came to represent a lot of the things that Dallas wanted to stand for. Born in 1960, the Cowboys were blessed with more faith than talent. After winning just nine of 40 games in their first three seasons, Landry's troops were unfairly targeted by a nation's anger over President Kennedy's assassination in Dallas in 1963. After six years in the league, Landry's fertile mind was still trying to find a way out of the wilderness. He did a lot of innovative and creative things. Most teams lined up in two formations, what they called red and brown. We lined up in about ten. He became an innovator on offense. You know, using uh, multiple formations, uh, motion, uh, moving players around, shotgun. To Tom Landry, football was like a chess game. The shotgun. Tom brought that back. He's the guy that started it in his so-called modern era of pro football. People say, why did the line get up and down? The line got up when the backs were shifting. So the defense couldn't see where the backs were shifting to. He was a defensive coordinator and the offensive coordinator at the same time. Even Vince Lombardi, even Paul Brown didn't do that. Defensively, he came up with the flex defense, was which nobody else could coach but him. He would coach the defensive tackles, the defensive ends, the linebackers, the cornerbacks, the safeties. The kind of understood joke was that Tom resented the players on occasion from getting in the way of his system, which he knew he had designed perfectly, and he could prove it if only the stupid players would stop being human and messing it up. I was the most valuable player in Super Bowl XII along with Harvey Martin. That next year, the Cowboys drafted a defensive tackle, and I just knew that he drafted them to take my position. You know, he had all these signs around the uh, training facility, and one of those signs said there was no such thing as an indispensable man, and that meant you are a cog in the wheel. Landry's systematic approach reached a bizarre height against Chicago in 1971. He shuttled quarterbacks Craig Morton and Roger Staubach on every play. Dallas lost 23-19. Coach made a big mistake. I think he really started to understand it was a combination of his preparation as well as having the right players emotionally, you know, teaming with him. 
In 1966, the right combination of blackboard schemes and passionate personnel not only took the Cowboys past the 500 mark for the first time, they almost beat Green Bay for the NFL championship. And it only got better. Over two decades, Dallas went to the playoffs 18 times and reached five Super Bowls, winning two. But even in the glow of his extended success, Landry remained a coach of heart, admired but seldom loved. I think my first five years with the Cowboys, I didn't like him at all. After we became really successful, then you believed in him. The problem when you're coaching is much like being a CEO. If you get too close to someone, you can't do the things that you need to do. Coach wasn't a touchy-feely type person. If you were meeting at 10 o'clock, you'd be there at 10 o'clock. If you were in a wreck on Central Expressway, you should have left earlier. I was over at the practice field on crutches watching practice, and, and he asked me where I was going to be at the game. I said, well, you know, I'll be on the sidelines. He says, no, I think you should probably just sit in the stands. It was not nearly as easy for him to give out the attaboys and way to go and good job as it was to critique how you had missed your assignment. Landry's detached approach was never more apparent than in his relationship with quarterback Don Meredith. The bravest thing that I ever saw was when he got out of the hospital and he had a broken rib and a punctured lung and pneumonia. And we went up and played in Cleveland. And we all played lousy. And Don took the brunt of that. Well, uh, he's in the hospital getting the blood pumped out of his lung. Tom is uh, holding a meeting saying what a bad game Don played. And it hurt Don so bad, people didn't realize how sensitive he is. I think that's the one ingredient that is missing from his personality, and that is a physical show to his team that he cares about what they do, whether it's good or whether it's bad. I've never seen him hug a player. I wondered for a long time if 10 years after Don Meredith retired at the age of 31, Tom didn't look in the mirror and say, maybe if I would have told him how much we needed him, uh, things might have been different. The degree of separation between Landry and his players can be measured by his Spartan beginnings in South Texas. Thomas Landry was born on September 11, 1924, in the tiny border town of Mission, Texas. His mother, Ruth, volunteered at the local church, and his father, Ray, ran an auto repair shop and was chief of the volunteer fire department. His dad was a hard-working man and uh, made a living, I mean, during the Depression. So there were values then of hard work and family that I'm sure were instilled in dad and by virtue of his childhood. His father was somebody the whole town looked at, looked up to, somebody who was in trouble. He was always ready to help. Miss Landry, who was just a calm, stay-at-home mother that was behind each one of her children and each one of his or her endeavors. They were both fairly reserved and stoic. I think that was probably some influence on him. Four children, Tom spoke with a list which contributed to his reserved nature. He was a very shy girl who'd come out and put their hands on the top of his shoulder and he'd start red as an apple. That's the way he's been all his life, kind of quiet. He don't get excited, he never does that. I mean, he's just Tommy Landry. As a fullback, quarterback, and safety, Landry led Mission High School to a regional championship in his senior year when the Eagles outscored their opponents 322 to 7. He had a coach, Bob Martin, who was head and shoulders above all coaches in the Valley at that time. And they played a football game with checkers where you move this, you block this guy this way, and played it just like the plays on the football field. Tom just knew football. We played, but he could understand it. After serving with the Army Air Corps in World War II, Landry returned to the University of Texas and was a star fullback. Following one season as a defensive back with the New York Yankees of the All-America Football Conference, he moved to the NFL Giants in 1950. He was very slow, but he could guard the receivers because he could anticipate, so he would go to the point and be there. And so he was a small pro. 
In 1954, in addition to his playing duties, Landry was made an assistant coach. There are players that, that execute, but they don't have the full understanding of why. He had it. And he also had the ability to communicate with other players on defense. Landry had earned an industrial engineering degree during his off-season and applied those principles to football. The result was the modern 4-3 defense. When the Giants won the NFL championship in 1956, he and Vince Lombardi, who coached the offense, received much of the credit. Tom Landry would uh, look at a film and break it down and get everything he needed out of it and half the time that, that Vince would. He was the first guy to ever do frequencies of teams. Now they do it all on computers, but Tom Landry did it in his head. When they're in this formation, they're going to run the play over here. And you look at it and you say, man, this is unbelievable. People have always written about Tom being the taciturn guy on the sideline. And what you don't understand about Tom Landry is that he was thinking. He was always deep in thought in what was going on out there. He was way ahead of everybody else. At 33, Landry was being hailed as a genius in his profession. But public acclaim failed to nourish a deeper need for the man from a town called Mission. If the corporate image he projected on the football field became a media staple, Tom Landry was also known as a paragon of Christian values. He definitely had a public image that, uh, you know, wasn't correct. You got to know him. He was just a person that didn't open up, you know, to, to strangers very easily. When he became a Christian in the late 50s, those priorities shifted. And that's where you get faith, family, and football as opposed to maybe football, family, and faith. My daughter was born about 10 weeks premature. And I remember he actually included my daughter in the pregame prayer. And I, you know, that was uh, one thing that I did not expect from him, but I should have, because he's a, a strong family man, strong Christian man. In 1984, when Drew Pearson got in a serious car accident that killed his brother and ended the wide receiver's career, Landry was at his side for support. I was like totally shocked. And seeing them there, I'll tell you, it just provided a tremendous motivation for me to get well, uh, not only physically, but uh, mentally. He lived his faith, and that spoke very loudly anytime you were around him. I got a telephone call on a Friday afternoon asking me to come to his office, which I did. He said, uh, I understand that Nikki and Dana aren't going back to Trinity Christian. I told him I couldn't afford it. He said, yes, you can. I've already taken care of it. Landry's private life revolved around his wife, Felicia, and their three children, Lisa, Kitty, and Tom Jr. They were college sweethearts, and his respect for her and love for her was obvious every day. She was very friendly and witty, and they complimented each other in their various attributes. And we go in this restaurant, and there's a couple sitting over there by themselves and looking at each other with these great adoring eyes, obviously two love birds. Well, it was Tom and Alicia. Alicia and their family, yeah, that was vitally important to him. And I think football was third, and I think there are a lot of, a lot of coaches and athletes for whom the reverse would be true. Tom was a very family-oriented type of person in terms of his personal family. In terms of the team family, uh, it wasn't a family, it was just a business. It's as if he checked his Christianity at the door every morning to go into his headquarters looking the other way. Already burdened with the title next year's champion because of five straight seasons that ended in postseason losses, Landry began the 1971 campaign with hopes riding on running back Dwayne Thomas, who had a drug problem. He compromised in 1971 with Dwayne Thomas because Dwayne was a hell of a running back at that time. And uh, doubtful they would have won the Super Bowl without him. Dwayne uh, didn't have to do some of the things that the rest of us did. I think a lot of people looked at it as uh, a slap in the face. And that's one time I had two set of standards for a football team. 
because our team has suffered through so many close games. We handled them. We handled them until we won the first Super Bowl, and then we couldn't we couldn't handle them anymore. Sometimes you need a shoulder to lean on, and that relationship is a very important relationship. And when it's not there, it can often be, you know, very, very alienating, if you will. Your ability to adapt and adjust to this new environment requires um, a lot of support, effort in every aspect. I don't feel like I got any support. Landry vowed to never compromise his values again. In 1979, he proved true to his word by cutting Pro Bowl linebacker Thomas Hollywood Henderson late in the season. I think he knew that I was different. The one thing he didn't know that I was seriously addicted to cocaine. He really didn't want to know about what you did off the field. He cared only about what you were doing in his presence. His management style or his way of handling it was I'm going to model, I'm going to teach, I'm going to instruct, and I'm going to show you. And then in the course of time, you will follow that behavior by your own decision. Although Landry's effect on his players may not always have been positive, some discovered the depth of his humanity after their careers were over. So I sent him an invitation to my 10-year sober celebration, and I never heard from him. And so I go downtown Austin to this hotel, and I walk to the top of these stairs, and I see a saddle-colored leather jacket, and it's Tom Landry. I just didn't know what to do to, to help him out. And the, I guess we end up saying, well, we need to get rid of him, you know, because we had no way to take care of him. And I think that was the most disappointing thing. As the 1980s wound down, disappointment began to build in Dallas as the Cowboys started losing, and the living legend that was Landry began to fade. Montana rolling out the right, looking toward the end zone, throwing under pressure, throws his pass, dramatic 28-27 defeat by the 49ers in January of 1982 was the second of three straight NFC Championship game losses. In 1986, the Cowboys dropped to below 500 for the first time in more than two decades. Under pressure to change, Landry held fast, refusing to scrap his vaunted flex defense and relinquish any of his power to new assistant coaches. He became more stubborn. He was truly a one-man show. Tom would never give up control of his team to anybody. His pride and ego was, was his undoing in the end because he stuck so stubbornly with his flex defense. The 64-year-old Landry had little support by 1988 when the Cowboys plummeted to 3-13. and His every decision was scrutinized. Yeah, 40. Yeah. No, on, we went on 23, but I think we were on 30. On the, the time that we ran the last play, yeah, 31. There were a lot of times that nobody knew about that Tom didn't know if it was 4th and 1 or 4th and 2. That was not an indicator that he was losing it mentally. The media was attacking him about the fact that he was getting up in age and he started getting seen out. He, you know, and I knew it was the players that really didn't have an understanding of what he was trying to do. Landry's hopes of coaching into the 1990s were crushed when Bum Bright sold the Cowboys in February of 1989. New owner Jerry Jones flew to Austin with general manager Tex Schramm to fire the man with 270 victories. My eyes were running. And uh, he just uh, walked out and I was there and I'm, I'm sorry. Disappointment was probably the number one uh, emotion. It's just an unfortunate circumstance that it happened, and, and, and no, it wasn't handled real well. It's just unfortunate that Tex Ram and Tom Landry can give their lives and build a Dallas cow Cowboy, but business also has to be addressed in close contact, and that's what we have. I know he was hurt, and I know he was angry. But he managed to be those things without being bitter. That's a huge measure of the man to me. 
in appreciation for Landry turning an expansion team into one of the most successful franchises in professional sports, the city of Dallas honored him with a parade. I have never heard of 50,000 people coming to a parade for a coach who had a 313 record the year before. I'll never be in another press conference again, but when I see you on the street, I'll sure say hello. Thank you very much. For Landry, a true test of his stoicism and faith came in 1995. After a four-year struggle, his daughter Lisa died of cancer. I have come to have faith in God, who is with me in every storm. My youngest daughter, Lisa, many of you heard her story, taught us how to live in grace and with courage and faith. Four years later, in 1999, Landry was diagnosed with leukemia. He stayed tough to the end. When they got the final diagnosis, one of his grandson had a baseball game. And so they were a little late, but they went out there and sat in the stands and nothing was wrong. I think he, he felt like if that was God's will, then that was God's will. And I don't believe that I ever heard him complain. There's a consistency about his behavior that is stronger than anyone I've ever known. Every time I visited with him in the hospital, he expressed gratitude and appreciation for my being there. I kept thinking to myself, I'm the one that's being strengthened by this man. Tom Landry, the former coach of the Dallas Cowboys, was not only a champion many times over, he was one of football's great innovators. Landry died of leukemia yesterday at the age of 75. When he passed away, so many people came back and said, gosh, Coach Landry had such a dramatic effect, a change in my life. And the thing that Coach Landry did that was so unique is that he planted a seed within you that just continued to grow for a long time. He didn't know it. And it really changed you as a person. People thought who idolized him that he was perfect. People thought who found him hypocritical that he was a charlatan. He was neither one of those things. And I think the best thing people can say about him is that he was a human being. He was a hell of a human being, but he was a human being. In the mid-60s, a false bomb scare in the press box had briefly halted play during a Cowboy game. Afterwards, Tom Landry was asked by a reporter what he would have done had there actually been a bomb and it had gone off. Landry Wiley replied, he would have observed a moment of silence and then resumed playing with enthusiasm. For Sports Century, I'm Chris Fowler.